when those collections start going from an average of you know 66 percent and by the way i will say that people were surprised to see these articles saying a third of renters didn't pay rent in uh, mm -hmm. april well that is actually not that far off from what's typical right i, I think that actual numbers typically at 75 percent or so depending on the class product type nationwide 75 percent of renters pay rent normally in april it was 66 percent so when we go into may that number may go down significantly and June may go down as well. When that happens and you have a true quarter of COVID collections, then there starts to be some uncertainty. Then there starts to be some fear in the marketplace. Like how long is this going to go on? How long until people are back and running and at full employment? And that's when the real opportunity starts to come. With no limitations, what does your perfect day look like? What if it's possible to live like that every day? Would you wake up after 9am, have perfect health, maybe fire your boss, have the money and freedom to do what you love most? The world is your oyster. Where would you be? Who would you be with? The possibilities are endless. Whether you believe it's possible for you or not, you can make more, work less and live free. Welcome to Freedom Hack Radio, where entrepreneur, best-selling author, world traveler and adventurer, Bryce Robertson and special guests crack the code on money, health, relationships, spirituality and having fun doing what you love most. Be inspired to create your own self-designed freedom lifestyle. Welcome back to another episode of Freedom Hack Radio. Today, I'm super excited to have Hunter Thompson from ASIM Capital joining us today to talk about recession resistant investments. So Hunter is a full time real estate investor and founder of ASIM Capital, a private equity firm based out of Los Angeles, California. Since founding ASIM Capital, he has overseen and directed the purchase of more than $90 million of commercial real estate across a variety of asset classes. He is author of Raising Capital for Real Estate, How to Attract Investors establish credibility and fund deals. Hunter is also the host of the Cashflow Connections Real Estate Podcast, which has received over 400,000 downloads. Um, today, Hunter and I are going to be discussing recession-resistant investments. Hunter, how you doing today, brother? Hey, thanks again, Bryce, for having me on. Absolutely. Great to have you on here, mate. Um, hey, first off, Hunter, what's got you feeling the most gratitude today, mate? What are you most thankful for today? Well, I'll be honest with you. This is a, a really interesting time. You know, we're going to talk a lot about why this time is unique, but the truth is, while it is true that this time is different, there are a lot of things that don't change. And I'm very, very grateful for the fact that I'm surrounded by people that are encouraging and are think intellectually and find interesting ideas compelling and are open for conversation. You know, one of the things that we found right now with this particular challenge is that, you know, there's a lot of really strict stuff going on and the room for an honest conversation about different narratives is being squashed. And um, we can talk a little bit about that if you're interested. But from my perspective, I'm very grateful to be surrounded by people that think intellectually and are critical of their own thoughts and are not worried about finding out that they're wrong. And um, that's literally what I wrote in my journal today. Because my, I myself have all the time figured out that ideas that I was huge proponents of ended up being wrong. It's really embarrassing. But at the end of the day, if someone teaches you something and you learn from them, once you realize that it's a time to be grateful, it's a really powerful concept. And then so you're always kind of finding truth. I think that you and a lot of your listeners can relate to that. We were not taught as children to invest in real estate. We were taught as children to mind our own business, give our money to a financial advisor. And um, we all ended up thinking to one degree or another, that, that was a lie. And so I'm very grateful to be surrounded with people like your listeners that are um, always up for questioning mainstream narratives. Awesome. That's, that's really awesome. And yes, we're going to dig into that um, a lot today in depth, uh, among other things. Before we get too deeply into those uh, topics, Hunter, what's the ultimate freedom lifestyle look like for you? You know what? It's interesting. I think a lot of people that get into real estate, they do so because the amount of personal freedom it can provide them. You can 
have an opportunity where if your income is not tied to the time that you put into your work, that you can foresee yourself going to Mexico for two months. And Bryce, you're one of the very few people that actually takes advantage of that. And the reason I say that is that I myself work very hard. Um, you know, I'm not one of those guys that does the 70 hour weeks over and over and over again, but I certainly um, do work all the time, right? And what's interesting about that though, is it doesn't bother me because I know that I can take that time off if I want to. And just that freedom of knowing that I'm in control of my own directive, it allows me to number one, work harder without having burnout, but also it's quite fun to go to Mexico for two months. And just knowing that that's on the table is a great feeling. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. So you like to get out and about yourself, don't you? What's, what's some places that you've been over the last 12 months? Well, you know, I have got married about nine months ago and we did our honeymoon in a resort, the likes of which I've never, ever been to a place like this called Salaz in Cabo, a uh, really nice luxury resort and spent about six days there. And usually when I go on trips, you know, I like to go see three countries in six days and just go from hotel to hotel or Airbnb to Airbnb because you want to see as much as you can in that respective area. But it was really nice to just sit at a really nice location with really great staff and just eat some good food and just sit and enjoy the moment, which was our honeymoon. Um, so Salaz, check it out. It's an absolutely amazing. Um, not less than 12 months ago, but certainly within the last three years. Portugal was one of my favorite places I've ever been. The Algarve there is just absolutely beautiful. I'm very much a foodie. So any place that there's great food, I'm probably going to try to visit. Um, so, you know, food drives the trips for me always. Beautiful way to go. Awesome. Love it. So um, that was the last 12 months. What about the next 12 months? What are they looking like for you? Good question. Um, we did have a friend that is scheduled to have a wedding in Italy in May, and that wedding has now been postponed, most likely to next May, um, just depending on the COVID concerns. That was going to be a really great one. So I think that will happen in the next 12 months, but it's obviously kind of a question mark at this point. Um, if that doesn't happen, my wife is in the event production business, and the corporate event world is, in particular has been hit by this corporate events and luxury generally and hospitality, they do tend to be more cyclical. We can talk about that a lot during this conversation, but this particular challenge has basically turned that industry off. And so we feel for the cities that are really dedicated towards hospitality, I feel for Vegas in particular, the moment that I can, I would love to do my own personal stimulus check right to the Vegas um, the casinos in Vegas into the hotels and there because I like that city a lot. Again, great food there. It's a lot of fun, but I'm assuming it looks like a ghost town right now and I'm sad because of that. So I think I'm going to do a personal stimulus package right to the, the Mirage. <laughs> there you go. Nice. So talking about recessions and recession resistant investments, like what is a recession a resistant investment and why is that so relevant now? Yeah. So, I mean, when it comes to recession resistance, this is something that I found very compelling early on in my career. Um, just a little background about myself. I kind of awoken to the world of finance around 2008. I was still in college at the time. 2008 happened, and it was kind of a green light. You, know, you always hear about investment blood is in the streets, and I could tell by the way that people were acting that this was – most likely a once a generation type of opportunity. So I dove into the world of stock market investing because that was most readily available to me. That was what the marketing was catered towards was the stock market. I started learning about value investing and there was a ton of value to be had back then and started pursuing that strategy and had legitimate and significant success for the next two years as most people did that started in 2008. But in 2010 hit a major roadblock, which people don't talk about. And it, for me, it was just that total last straw moment, which was the European debt crisis started. And I basically was obsessively watching CNBC every day and, and CBS and all these places that were kind of talking about the financial markets. And all of a sudden, everyone was talking about the Greece bond yields. And they were focusing on the 10-year rate. And they said, if the Greece bond yields went below 7%, the S&P was going to be fine. But if the 10-year the, the went above 7%, the S&P was going to collapse. And this was taking place every single day, intraday. It would go above and below that marker, and you'd see massive 600, 700-point swings in the Dow Jones. And so I found 
that regardless of how much research I did on this topic, I was never going to be able to make my portfolio uncorrelated to these completely unmitigatable risks. I could not foresee that the Greece bond yield, particularly the regarding the 7% number, was going to play a significant role in my portfolio. And I went on a pursuit to try to find investment vehicles which were not subject to those types of risk as it relates to the stock market, but also as it relates to the economy in general. And so this pursuit led me to real estate very quickly. And then within real estate, I found that in the world of recession resistance, if you can find vehicles in which the demand for the product is inversely correlated with the overall economy, you create a very balanced and measured portfolio. Because when the economy does well, you're more likely able to raise rents. You can increase occupancies more efficiently. You can actually add value to the property and then justify further rental increases. But when the economy contracts, let's say the most great example, in my opinion, and I know you're sympathetic to this, is the mobile home park business. The worse the economy does, the more demand there is for affordable housing. So you're kind of getting the best of both worlds. You don't have to give up too much of the upside because you still can raise rents when the economy is booming and unemployment rates are low. But when unemployment rates spike, the demand for the product pushes people down into those more affordable places to live. And there's a million other reasons the mobile home park business is compelling, but I just saw that as a massive tailwind without giving up too much upside. So I was compelled by the mobile home park business, the self-storage business, and to a, a certain extent, the multifamily business within certain niches and certain class types. So that was my background. That's how I really got into the world of recession-resistant real estate. And so would you say that those types of real estate are the, the main areas that you focus on today? You mentioned mobile home parks, self-storage, and some certain sectors of multifamily. Yeah, I would. Now, the caution there, though, is that simply stating that big picture thesis is enough to make something interesting, but it doesn't mean that that's the entire dependent, you know, the entire investment thesis is not dependent on that theory being correct. In fact, that theory can be correct and you can lose a ton of money. It's like similar to saying, hey, they're not building any more land. That's why investing in real estate is a good deal, right? It's like just a more advanced version of that. So I say that to say what's critical is identifying best in class operating partners that are ethical actors that have systems that have processes that have relationships that they can rely on when things go wrong to protect and grow investor capital and that's what we do as a company we identify those operating partners now going back to the recession resistant component i think the mobile home park business has recently got a lot of attention because of the fact that it's recession resistant but also because the supply demand disequilibrium is very favorable in the sense that there's actually less and less of them every single year. Now, a lot of your listeners are familiar with that at this point, but I'm telling you, 10 years ago, if you were to have this conversation, that discussion would be completely unheard of. It was very, very uncommon for people to be even knowledgeable about that, especially in the world of private investors, you know, non-institutional investors. So now you're starting to build a more compelling thesis. You've got all these baby boomers hitting the age of retirement. Many of them have very little savings. You've got a really interesting a demand increase and a supply contraction, and you have that whole recession resistant component. And that's just one example, but it's not just that that theory makes sense. The data has been very, very compelling as well. And we have a lot of data from publicly traded companies which show that the NOI growth, particularly in the mobile home park business, is extremely reliable as that consistent rental income increases. Now, that again does not paint the whole picture because real estate is not simply about NOI growth. You also need to have cap rate compression to experience appreciation. So what we've seen over the last 10 years has been interesting because the mobile home park business has completely blown every other asset class out of the water in terms of NOI growth. Now the multifamily apartment business, because of how popular and how competitive it is, has experienced a very significant amount of cap rate compression. So you actually could have experienced very favorable returns in the multifamily business, where the NOI growth was actually stronger in the mobile home park business, which is why I'm a huge proponent of being diversified, because all these things play out differently. It's hard to predict well, they, where everything will fall out. But within real estate, I'm happy to participate as long as there's that recession-resistant component because of the predictability of the outcome.
Yeah, absolutely. And I completely agree, which is why, you know, Hunter, I got involved in mobile home parks uh, a long time ago because when the re recessions were almost inevitable, something like that was going to happen again. And so I wanted to be in a really good position. Um, and I want you to talk on why you think uh, these asset classes are recession resistant. Before we do that, you were, you were mentioning NOI. Um, which means net operating income. Do you want to just quickly explain NOI, what it means, and then how a cap rate is going to come in play with that in commercial real estate? Yeah, and I appreciate you kind of going through that. And if I mention another term that is not that familiar, just let me know. I'm happy to, to go into the details. So NOI is the net operating income, is basically the, the gross income minus the expenses gives you your net operating income. And real estate is traded on a multiple of that income. And what we call that is the cap rate. So you take the, the NOI, divide it by the market cap rate, which is something in the range of, let's say, 7%, and that would give you your purchase price of that particular property. Now, different property types have different cap rates associated with them. So right now, as of the discussion that's being recorded, which is the end of April 2020, a 7% cap rate, very hard to come by um, because people are willing to pay more for that same stream of income, meaning that the cap rate is lower. So cap rates and purchase prices act inversely. And if you play with this on a calculator, you'll quickly understand kind of what the implications are and why those two are inversely correlated. Yeah, and when your when your uh, net operating income changes and your cap rate doesn't change, then you've just changed the value of your mobile home park or whatever asset that you're actually calculating. Um, so essentially, if you're if you can control the net operating income of your investment, you can essentially control the financial future of that investment as well to a certain extent, right? Exactly. So just to clarify, so a cap rate, the way that I would calculate a cap rate is the anticipated year one NOI divided by the purchase price, and that would equal mm -hmm. your cap rate. Now, the reason I said year one is that there's a lot of different ways to calculate cap rate. Some people will take the first three months of NOI times four divided by the purchase price. Some people will take the projected first 12 months, of the, I guess, divided by the purchase price, and other people will take the previous 12 months or the previous three months. All of those different metrics can create a different cap rate for that same property, and different people will project different things. So as you start to be a more and more sophisticated investor, you need to start asking questions about how that cap rate is actually calculated, even though you may know the definition of a cap rate, everyone's calculation can be different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so I you, you mentioned selecting the year one when you're going to be operating or you and your partners are going to be operating that property. And I'm assuming that you're doing that because one, you could take the last 12 months, but that would be based off how the previous owners of the property operated it. And you may do it differently. You may have different expenses. And secondarily, because you're taking into consideration any of the immediate repairs and improvements you need to make, right? Exactly. And what we want to do is we'll We'll show all of the numbers to our investors. We'll show the different, like let's say there's four different ways to calculate cap rate, which is what I just showed. You know, we'll announce our perception of the cap rate, and then in a pro forma, we'll show the different variations of that calculation so investors can get a sense of it. But the key is, if you're discussing this with investors, it's good to be consistent. So pick one that's appropriate and just do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then also with um, with cap rates, they change too, don't they? Like as as our uh, lending landscape of different loans and interest rates that are available for loans change, then our cap rates can change and supply and demand and a few other things come into play. So the cap rate can sort of consistently be moving, right? We've got to be able to keep up with that target. That's exactly right. So it's market dependent. And I think what's interesting about certain types of multifamily, you see less variance in those cap rates. So I'll give you a quick example. In the mobile home park business, there have been products which in 2000, let's say 12, when things started to get back to normalcy, those mobile home parks may have been trading at a 12 cap. I know that sounds shocking in today's market, now they are trading in a sub six cap. So this would be mm -hmm. tertiary markets, small product types that have gone and basically had a 600 basis point correction or compression in terms of their cap rate. So what they've done yeah. is the pendulum has swung very, very far. Now, 
just based on probability and such, the likelihood that that same property will swing back to a 12 cap is more pronounced than a property that started at a five cap and moved to a four cap. You see, because the, the variance there, the pendulum typically would not move that far. So again, it's a case for diversification because the multifamily sector, class B multifamily, you're likely not going to see a 600 basis point correction. So it's just another reason why you should be diversified if you're looking at this from a passive investment standpoint. Yeah, and it's it's been interesting to see how cap rates have been moving. You know, back in 2015, I was still buying mobile home parks at 12 caps. 2017, that dropped down to nine caps. And now it's like, it's challenging to find something in the in the eight to nine cap range. Most of it's like, you know, six or maybe seven. And, and those investments uh, even have some like things wrong with them. Like, well, not necessarily wrong, but things that wouldn't validate giving them um, a, a higher purchase price, like the risk of private utilities and things like that too. So we're definitely seeing things differently um, do you think, do you think that cap rates are going to stay the same over the next 12 months or two years? Where do you think they're going to head generally? So I am bearish on this situation with COVID in the sense that this is very ahistoric. I think that from the household level to the institutional level, people are not prepared adequately for this type of fall off in demand. Most underwriting models, and I don't mean to say that households need to have underwriting models, but let's just say you have someone who's like neurotic, like someone like myself and my wife, where we're creating our own financial statement and we say within a high degree of certainty, we can anticipate this taking place. It is very hard to anticipate your business going from 100% revenue to 0% revenue. That is not typical of even the most pronounced recessions. And this is what we're currently doing. Now, there is some caveats to that. One of them is that one of the reasons recessions tend to be very challenging to come out of is there's a mental component and an emotional component associated with having your business fail because it's very challenging to see what the cause was of that. Is it because of the recession or is it because you didn't have thick enough profit margins? Were you not actually good enough at running a business? All these questions impact someone's emotional ability to get back into the workforce, start a new company, find the best way that they can put their energy and their resources towards making new, cool, and efficient products. That is not the case with COVID. You're not seeing the guilt associated with having a business fail that you normally would because everyone understands on the whole planet that this is an external factor. Um, your business may have fallen not because of supply demand, but because of a government shutdown, which is not related in any way to how successful your business is. So I'm anticipating a faster snapback. It's just that having a pause right now, it's not just, I think people have a lot of misconceptions about the economy. This isn't, the economy isn't the stock market. The economy is the voluntary exchange of millions and billions of people all over the world. So when the economy struggles, it means someone's best friend is going to lose their job. Right. I think there's just a lot of miscommunication in that in the narrative is that, oh, you only care about the economics. Well, it's like that's the livelihood of billions of people. So that economics um, does tie into everything, but it's not just numbers. Right. It's actually the reality of whether or not you can pursue your own freedom to a large degree. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, there's I, I've spoken to some people who seem to think that, you know, everything's going to get back to sunshine lollipops as soon as they um, release the, the stay stay safe at home act. And they you know, I actually believe it's going to be pretty different. And, you know, I'm hearing a lot of people talking about like COVID and what's happening with COVID. Whereas I'm keeping my eye on the ball of what's really happening with the economy underneath all of this. Mm. Um, what do you think was the cause of this crash? Do you think it was COVID or did you see something like this happening anyway? Well, you know, I'll put it this way, looking again from a probabilistic standpoint, and I don't think this is the most accurate way to look at it, but this is one of the largest of the largest economic recovery in the history of the United States in the sense mm -hmm. that the moment from the trough, the bottom of the market to the amount 
prior to the COVID scare was the longest expansionary period. Uh, that number is from the National Bureau of Economic Research and they track recessions and such. And I don't remember the exact number of how many recessions they've been in the last 200 years, but there's a lot and it was the longest recovery. So from a probabilistic standpoint, I and most investors have been anticipating a significant correction. You know, every conversation I've had that's lasted more than 30 minutes over the last five years has predominantly been based on when is the next correction going to be and how significant is it going to be? Now, you can listen to my podcast on these topics that I've had with economists. Uh, you know, it, from my perspective, it was very challenging to see a world where we could see a 20% correction in the multifamily sector, for example. The reason I said this many times in my podcast was that the debt component, the debt terms, the leverage rates, the interest only periods, the nature of the regulations surrounding debt, um, those were not in insane 2006 levels. And so because debt drives a big portion of the real estate business, it's the majority of the purchase. If you're buying a $10 million property, usually $6 million or $7 million will be in debt. So what does that mean? Mm. Debt drives the entire market. And furthermore, the debt terms and the debt component will almost exclusively be the determining factor in whether or not the investors keep their money. Because if you think about the, all the horror stories you've heard about investors losing money, it always has to do with the debt coming due too soon. They couldn't refinance. The interest only period ended. They couldn't find a new lender. That's how people actually lose money in real estate about 99% of the time. So when I see the debt terms not being extremely aggressive, generally, it was very hard for me to see a world where we could see a 20% correction. Now we've had this a historic crisis and government action, which you could see an opportunity for that. You could see an opportunity for cap rate expansion to take place, something that hasn't taken place in the last 10 years. Yeah. Okay. So do you think that um, COVID like created this economical downturn or do you think it's more of just like COVID was the pin that popped the bubble? Yeah, good question. So it's hard for me to answer because of the fact that we have had the massive shutdowns that have like trying to be accurate when I say this. So if you have a retail center that was going along and making profit and you have 13 tenants and they all had healthy balance sheets and now all of a sudden the foot traffic is reduced to zero. It's not that all of your customers died. It's that to a large degree, they were ordered not to attend your business. So I want to make a clear distinction between blaming that lack of customer on a virus when the reality is the foot track of has been reduced due to concerns about the virus. At least I think that important distinction should be made. So, you know, I'm maybe not, I guess from the, the nature of the question, I maybe wasn't as concerned about the health of the economy as you might have been. Um, but in terms of recessions, this is a cyclical business. This is why I've been willing to give up a lot of the upside associated with more aggressive investment strategies, such as development. I was also able to give up and willing to give up a lot of the more aggressive asset classes, such as hotels, for example. You know, we've seen a once in a lifetime type of drop off in terms of flying, for example, 98% reduction in passenger travel. But generally speaking, the hotel business is incredibly cyclical. This is why Vegas tends to operate in these wild swings. So our portfolio was positioned well for COVID, but it wasn't just luck. It was like the self-storage business generally does not experience massive shifts in demand when there's a recession. Why? Well, the majority of the demand is caused by people going through some sort of change or transition in their life or downsizing. So you have kids moving home from college unexpectedly. I cannot tell you how many times I've said that phrase on podcasts over the last five years. Kids moving home from college unexpectedly drives demand for self-storage. Now, I didn't predict that COVID literally would have kids cancel the second part of their semester and then immediately have to move home unexpectedly, but we have seen a significant increase in all the self-storage units that we own near universities. We've seen that directly in line. Now, my point is there's some reoccurring things that are brought up during all recessions, and we've been prepared for that 
pretty well. Now, I will say in all fairness, over the last three years, I have constantly been saying the retail apocalypse is to a large degree a hoax in the sense that there are many very successful retail businesses and centers filled with tenants like karate places and pizza restaurants and grocery stores that are completely unaffected by Amazon. And I have been talking about how excited I am for the potential opportunity in retail. Now, I think that I got very lucky in the sense that we never found a deal that made sense. I just couldn't make the pencils work. And I'm trying to be honest about that because if we did move forward with any of those deals, we would be sending out a completely different type of communication than my attitude right now. So I always want to be yeah. open about that. Yeah, I think there's a, I think there's a lot of people in the retail space that'd be hurting right now for sure. Um, so, <clears throat> I mean, right now we're, we're coming up to about halfway through 2020. Um, how long do you think this is going to last for economically? How long do you, do you think the effects are going to stick around for people? Is this something that's, you know, it's going to be quick, everything will be back to normal in a couple of months here, or are we going to see some changes over the next few years? What do you think? So I've got some good news and some bad news. The good news is we aren't the only country involved. The bad news is China is ahead of us and they're not super transparent about the actual data coming out of their country. So China, to a large degree, at least from the numbers that I've seen, and there is some speculation about the validity of those numbers, but it does look like they have opened up and people are going back to work. A traffic in terms of the daily travel vehicles that they track, which is publicly available, at least to my knowledge, has increased back to about 90% of what it was previously. The problem is that, what's the word, um, travel unrelated to work travel for mm -hmm. pleasure basically has been reduced by about 80% from its normal levels prior mm -hmm. to this crisis. So every country is different. People respond to crises different, but I would anticipate at least for right now, that seems to be the most likely outcome. Now there's other countries like Sweden, for example, which has not implemented the same kind of shelter in place, but we have also seen a pretty significant drop off in leisure travel. That was the word I was looking for. And mm -hmm. leisure travel is an important part of the business, right? Not just because of the events and, and that whole business, but also in terms of the mentality of me going out and, and buying things and using money to exchange for other goods and services that are then used to purchase other goods and services. So um, I don't anticipate that there's going to be a snapback. I, I made some mistakes in my predictions early on where I said, if there was a 100% effective vaccine that was administered to 100% of the population tomorrow, we would all go back to normal. Now, the coming weeks, and this is you know two months ago, which in COVID time is like you know five years ago, but in the coming weeks, I came to find that this is actually really impacting society in terms of the emotional component. Um, not to the same degree as a normal recession, but still, that is there. So you you were saying something before about people going out there and spending money and and, and different transactions happening out there in the economy. Um, one term that we could use to um, refer to that is the velocity of money, like how quickly it's changing hands and whatnot. So you're anticipating that the velocity of money is going to slow down because of people's sentiment or the way that they feel about all of this. Yeah, well, it's really a you know, I'm a big proponent of the Austrian School of Economics, and um, not that I have formal training in it, just, you know, the way that most people are learned these days by finding a few people that they identify with and studying everything that they've put out. Um, so investment in the future is what this is all about. Are people willing to invest in their own future? Like in a contraction in the economy, which is what a recession is, you know, most people define it as two quarters of negative economic growth. That's how economists like to say growth. Well, we had growth. It just happened to be negative. Well, what I would call that is a contraction. So what I don't like as an entrepreneur, what I think right now is a great time to do is make a commitment to yourself that you are going to make it. And a big way to do that is start investing in your own skills, showing yourself that you are going to be around. You are going to be investing into the future, not only financially, but also emotionally and like spiritually and everything. Right. So, um, Yes, what we see during recessions is people start to do things like clean up their balance sheet as opposed to invest in something that's going to pay dividends later down the road, whether it's education, whether it's actually an investment, whether it's I want to book a trip three months out. 
this is something that we've seen, you know, on a macro level from, you know, Japan, for example, where in the end of the 90s, they had what's referred to or what was coined at the time a balance sheet recession, where all of a sudden industries and households were not concerned about investing in the future, but we're concerned about reducing the levels of debt that we have. And what we saw the Japanese government and then later the United States government do is reduce interest rates to try to spur investment in the future so that people would say, I can take on additional debt so I can buy this real estate, so I can go open up a business, so I can go on this vacation. But it's like saying, okay, I've got a bunch of poisonous apples, okay? And they're a dollar a piece. Now, can I sell you one? And you go, uh, no, they're poisonous. I don't want one. And I go, all right, how about 50 cents? And you're like, no, you must have not heard me. I'm not eating poisonous apples. That's what happens in a balance sheet recession. If people view debt as poison, it doesn't matter if you drop interest rates to negative five, that's not compelling. So those are all just things to think about. It's all about investment in the future. We can get that investment going. The economy starts to heat up again. And so when do you think the economy would heat up again? Do you think that we've already hit rock bottom? Do you think that there's more downturn to come? So I definitely think that we have a lot of more downturn to come. We have not really felt the pain yet. Many households can float themselves for a month or two. And I know there's probably going to be some listeners that say there's a lot of data suggests that most people don't have two weeks of savings in their bank account. I understand that. But what happens when that two weeks of savings is done? That doesn't mean they starve to death. What happens is they have access to credit card debt. They have access to friends and family. So they can extend themselves usually for a month or two. Businesses, it's a very similar situation, right? They may have a certain amount in cash, but they have access to debt. They have access to friends and family. So a month or two starts to paint a very clear picture. Uh, tenants have had to pay rent once, at least in the multifamily sector. That number in May is very important, and I think the number in June is far more important. When those collections start going from an average of you know, 66%, and by the way, I will say that people were surprised to see these articles saying a third of renters didn't pay rent in uh, mm -hmm. April. Well, that is actually not that far off from what's typical. Right? I think the actual number is typically at 75% or so, depending on the class product type. Nationwide, 75% of renters pay rent normally. In April, it was 66%. So when we go into May, that number may go down significantly, and June may go down as well. When that happens and you have a true quarter of COVID collections, then there starts to be some uncertainty. Then there starts to be some fear in the marketplace like how long is this going to go on? How long until people are back and running and at full employment? And that's when the real opportunity starts to come. I'm not very worried about the mobile home park business. I'm, the self-storage business has been largely unimpacted, but the multifamily business, there's going to be some concern and some fear, which will create an opportunity for pricing arbitrage, pricing arbitrage in Q3, in my opinion, and Q4. And then that's when things will start to work themselves out. And I think you know Q1 will start to see the recovery of this start to happen, assuming that a lot of those government lockdowns um, are start to be relaxed and we don't have a really significant uh, second wave of this um, at that time. Okay, so you, st you still think we're going to feel the pain for the most like for the rest of the year and if not early into next year, yeah? I think so. I think that's, you know, I had an economist recently on our podcast that's a consultant to the IMF who recently put out a report called Recession or Depression. I think that that's really the question at this point. I think that we're in for a really challenging several quarters. Um, I think a depression is defined as 10 quarters of negative economic growth. That's right, I believe. Um, you know, that would be extreme. Um, and I don't think we're headed for that for a lot of reasons. Okay. Gotcha. Um, so you mentioned before that uh, multifamily, you know, it's a niche. There's niches within multifamily. And you're saying that mobile home parks and self-storage generally pretty good. And I want you to talk on why in a minute. But first, let's just touch on multifamily. Why, why do you think that there's areas in within multifamily that would be affected differently where, what's safe and, and what's not so safe right now? Yeah, so I'll be honest with you. Everyone has their own opinion about this, and it's very hard to get true 
data from privately held companies, which are actually what's important. A lot of REITs only purchase one particular product type, and it's hard to get accurate data based on how your investment thesis is going to play out. So here's just my speculation. Uh, class A is, to a large degree, insulated from this particular risk. Many of the tenant base can work from home. Class C, there's some real challenges in terms of the tenant base and the employment. You know, a lot of the tenant base is going to be working in manufacturing jobs. A lot of them are going to have factory jobs. A lot of them are going to have construction jobs. Those are basically paused. Now, the good news is a lot of the government programs are specifically designed to cater to this particular group in the sense that they know that they're going to be feeling the pain. Um, so I think in the short term, Class C and Class B are going to feel some challenges with collections, while Class A should remain relatively unchanged. Uh, unchanged. Generally speaking, I'm not a big proponent of Class A because I think that outsized returns can be produced on a more consistent basis in Class B and Class C. Now, Class A recently has been very interesting because as everything's been smushed in terms of cap rates, you know, you saw Class B cap rates going from 10% down to 5%. Class A was basically always at 5%. Then all of a sudden, the difference between buying a Class A apartment and buying a Class B apartment was a difference of buying a five cap and buying a 4.5 cap. All of a sudden, Class A starts to look really compelling from that perspective. But I don't really play that game because I like to buy higher cap rate properties, generally speaking. So that's kind of a, a very quick synopsis. I think that the government programs will positively impact the lower incomes, but um, it's just a matter of seeing how long this will last. So multifamily for you, you don't see it across the board being a generalized recession resistant asset class. It's more just like there's some there's some niches within multifamily that can be recession resistant or, or feel the impact less, yeah? Exactly. And part of that is due to the fact that particularly class B and class C cater to people who are making median income. And so, mm -hmm. well, there's always people that are going to be making median income. That's the definition of median. But more importantly, when there is a recession, if everyone moves down a rung, if everyone loses 30% of their income, there's still going to be people making 45000 or $50,000 a year plenty of them, no matter what happens. So yeah. that's the kind of the recession resistant component. You add to that when the market heats up and the economics all of a sudden become very advantageous for development, it almost exclusively is class A that's developed. So you can have a situation where a lot of class A becomes economically viable to be developed. A lot of units come on the market all simultaneously and it can create some volatility in class A sector. I don't invest in class A, so it's not really my area of expertise, but this is what the data suggests. Gotcha. Gotcha. And so why mobile home parks? I mean, for, for me, being a, a big mobile home park guy myself, interestingly, I've seen that with the unemployment insurance getting paid out for tenants that aren't working right now, it matched with the stimulus package, a lot of them are actually in a better financial position had they have been working. Um, and this is probably only evident because I'm in the affordable housing space of mobile home parks. Um, what are you seeing and, and why are you considering mobile home parks and self-storage being solid recession resistant investments? So it's not surprising that people who work on hourly rages, uh, which the majority of mobile home park tenants do, can have you know significant negative impacts by something like a no work order. However, when you look at the proportion of what $1,200 means to someone who is living in a property that likely rents for somewhere in the range of $300, it all of a sudden becomes very consequential. If I get a $1,200 check that I can spend however I want, that could likely be three months or four months of rental income from a mobile home park tenant. Now, if I have mm -hmm. two adults in that same property, that could be six months of rental income. Mm -hmm. So that's very consequential. That's not consequential if you're in class A, for example, where it could be half a month. So that's a really yeah. important part. It's the same thing that you're saying with different data, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. Putting, putting people in a better position. And what I see as a mobile home park operator is when things like this happen, we have a recession, we have an economical downturn, there's a little bit more activity, there's more people that are going to be going through the eviction process, but we see much, much more demand on the back end of that transaction where the, a home comes available and now our phone's ringing off the hook because there's tons of people who have had to downsize from, from other areas. 
uh, or other asset classes or other types of property to come to a cheaper, you know, monthly rent down in mobile home parks. Um, I'm assuming that self storage is, is this similar from your perspective, because people are downsizing and they're transitional and they need somewhere to put their stuff. That's correct. And this, the theory is now being proven to be true. Um, from a big picture the self storage market has been the least impacted by the major commercial real estate asset classes in the public markets. We can't see into the future, but the public markets give us a good insight in terms of what the smartest people in the world typically are going to anticipate. Now, I will say that, you know, senior um, self storage, I will say, it's not just people downsizing and moving home from college. It's also businesses that have space in factories, which is very expensive. And those warehouses may be too expensive for them right now when they're not conducting actual business. So they need to move their actual equipment into self storage. You know, we saw the person who actually did the catering at our wedding, Cali Craft Cocktails. I'll give them a little shout out. They're moving their things into self storage. And, you know, they didn't announce this as like a pro self storage thing. They just let it be known that's where they're going to be for the time being. Um, if it's okay with you, I'd love to talk about senior living, though. It's a really interesting asset class, but it has some unique risks when it comes to this particular thing for obvious reasons. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's a really relevant topic right now. So I'd love it if you got into that. So for the last five years, I have been very, very bullish on senior living. It's a very interesting asset class. I think everyone is probably very aware of the demographic shift, which is taking place in the United States, which make the asset class compelling. Once you start getting into it, though, it is far more complex than any other asset class in which that I've conducted due diligence. It's a fully functioning business. It's like running a cruise and a restaurant and a casino where a lot of people may pass away just generally I mean, because the nature of the tenant base. So it's important to know within the senior living sector where you're going to operate. And it's very important that you have a consultant or an expert in that particular niche. Now, we've kind of made our first investment in the senior living sector. And so this COVID risk has been a very much a concern for us a little bit early on because the tenant base is more susceptible to the risk. But the interesting thing about this is there's a couple things. One is that the NOI has not really meaningfully decreased, at least not for tenants that are in place. The tenants that are there are not reliant on job income, employment income. Most of them are retired. So they either have savings, they have home equity that they've withdrawn that's going to allow them to pay for their stay at a senior living facility or their relatives, most of which are making $100,000 or more in jobs that are able to be outsourced and done online, I should say. Not outsourced, but done from home. So you're seeing the NOI not decrease. But the challenge is the tenant base is more susceptible to passing away because of the risk. And we have seen a couple of senior living facilities where one person gets the virus, then 19 people get it, and you know five pass away. And that's just really sad. And from a economic standpoint, one of the challenges with the senior living business is that the operating expense ratio is much higher. So in a typical multifamily deal, in the industry, we usually say 50% of the income will go to pay off expenses. That's pretty high even. So, but that's like a conservative number. Half of the income will go to pay off expenses. In the senior living sector, because of how much labor there is, it could be as high as 70% or more. So when you have five tenants pass away, let's say you have 100 units and you're 90% occupied. You're going from 90 whatever I said, 95% occupied, 95 units to 90%. Well, now if 10 more pass away, you're talking about having trouble paying off that debt service. The good news though, is that these facilities are very well prepared for this particular risk because it's not just now that all of a sudden they're concerned about germs. This is, they're well aware of how to quarantine individuals who are sick. They're well aware of how to best practices in terms of non-transmission. So it's an interesting market, long-term, very, very bullish. We're doing due diligence on a deal right now that we're just paused because we're not going to be the first people to transact in this environment. We need to see a market price be established in a post-COVID world, and then we need to get a discount to that market. We're not quite there yet, as of the recording of this interview. 
Yeah, yeah. That's and it's an interesting topic that you're bringing up here, you know, senior living, assisted living. I think there's an abundance of opportunities there. And it's something that we're going to see people talk a lot more over the next, you know, five to 10 years. I actually just wrote an article for Bigger Pockets, uh, warning about how the 2020 recession or the current economical circumstances is significantly different to 2008. Why? And one of the reasons in there is the, uh, the demographic trends that we're actually seeing right now and in the near future with the silver tsunami, all of the pensioners uh, retiring and bringing homes available and also the need for housing and um, you know, taking care of these guys. And that's, that increases, that demand is just going to increase astronomically over the next five, 10 years. And it's something that just needs to be filled. I mean, affordable housing is already a challenge uh, in America and senior living is like, it's going to be a growing abundant challenge. And if you're on the right side of that, I believe with the right operators, like you say, and the right investment, I, I believe it can be very advantageous. Yep. Completely agree. Now, again, you know, I have the tendency to go into the details, but just want to make it clear that that is totally true. It's just that everyone knows that. So the question is how, I mean, I don't mean everyone, but like anyone listening to this podcast, they're probably familiar with that, right? The numbers and the demographics. The question is how do you best take advantage of that? And that is a very, very complicated question when it comes to this particular niche. And so I love the idea that the demographic shift is happening and that more and more people need to know it because it's going to create a lot of interest in the asset class, which will create a lot of opportunity for cap rate compression. But you and I both know what really matters is, do you have an operator that really knows the business inside and out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think an operator makes up for the higher majority of decision-making um, if you're an investor getting involved in a deal, I always told my investors, if you're getting involved in the deal, put at least 51% of your decision making power on the operator and your, your viewpoint of their ability to be able to see through that investment really well. And um, it's definitely important to have your investment, the actual investment itself, and the investment model and the market and everything like that to check out. But you, you can take a, a phenomenal um, operator and an average asset and they can turn it around and make it perform really well. But you can also take a very average operator and what seems to be a phenomenal asset and they can run it into the ground. So exactly I right. think that's very important. Very important you bring that up. So uh, is there anything different that we need to consider in this 2020 economic downturn, things that weren't so relevant in past downturns or, or say different to 2008? Yeah. So if you ask me after we get off, I'll send you a, a little Monday minutes that I do on my show where I kind of compare 2001 recession to 2008 to 2020. Yeah. And um, they're all very interesting. So, I mean, obviously 2001 for all intents and purposes was a very calm recession. And there's some debate as to whether it was actually a recession because there was eight months of negative economic growth, but it wasn't the full quarters. Like if you look at the actual quarters, they weren't full quarters. So very calm. I think jobs, jobless claims peaked out at about 350,000, somewhere in that range. So what that means is new people who are saying, I am now unemployed and I need to get unemployment. That doesn't mean that's the number of people who are unemployed, right? So in 2008, that number of unemployed people making that claim was up to about 670,000, somewhere between 650 and 750,000, somewhere in that range. And this data is publicly available. And then in 2020, we saw that number go to 3.3 million one week. The next week was 6 million. The next week was 6 million. So we're talking about millions, like something like 20 million people ended up being unemployed as in claiming that number, which is absolutely historic and significant and should be taken very, very seriously. Again, I think that this particular challenge is interesting because the emotional component of not knowing if it was your fault or not is not really quite there. So that when the opportunity for the job market to open up exists, I think the return to normal will be more quickly than we saw, especially in a 2008 situation. Uh, 2008 was very much an aberration. Anytime a recession is driven by a credit crunch, you're going to see a pronounced and long lasting change. And so 2008, the market truly flows up. You know, there was no flexibility to be given. Renters may have lost their job and therefore they couldn't pay rent. And then the property owners couldn't pay the mortgage. 
what typically happens is that everyone is well positioned from a balance sheet standpoint so that the property owners can say, we can give you some flexibility. You'll get your, your new job. You'll get back on your feet very quickly. And then lenders may even say, hey, to the property owners, we understand you've been making these payments for five years. You're only doing this because this is the middle of a recession. We'll give you three months to get back on your feet. What happened in 2008 was that the banks were forced through liquidity and lack of it to actually foreclose the property was in their best interest to take the asset and sell it even for pennies on the dollar just to repair their balance sheet. As of this moment, I'm not anticipating that death spiral, which took place in 2008. Okay. So what are you expecting that's going to be happening with real estate pricing in like, say, 2021 to 2023? Man, that's a great question. Um, it's honestly very hard for me to predict. I would say that there are going to be some 20% from their high opportunities out there. Um, in the asset classes, which are more exposed to those spaces. You know, I think I don't participate in the hotel space, but there are billionaires that that's all they've done, right? So there's always ways to make money in these opportunities. Um, I don't think there's going to be that huge of a pricing arbitrage opportunity in multifamily, but I could be wrong. So we'll have to be cautious. We'll have to be very cautious and focus on appropriate debt financing. If I can get a, a property that's 94% occupied, where collections are high and have been relatively unhurt by COVID and I can get 10 year term and I can get a 68% loan to value. And I think I can produce a 13% IRR. I'm going to do that all day. I'm going to do that in 2007. I'm going to do that in 2012. I want to intelligently participate in the market, but in order to do that, you have to focus on your debt because at the end of the day, that will predict whether or not your investors keep their capital. Mm-hmm. So what steps are you taking to best position yourself now? Is there anything that you're doing that you're changing now and like over the next few months? So if transaction volume is decreased and you can't make a justification for getting a discount to market, it's a really important time to double down on your own future. You know, this podcast interview is an example of that. I want to attract investors. I want to learn from you and other people like you. I want to double down on getting new skills. I want to double down on relationships. You know, it doesn't mean that I have to contract emotionally. It means that what I need to do is focus on how I can put myself in a better position to take advantage of potential opportunities later down the road. So whatever it is that's on your to-do list, if you're listening to this, you've been pushing it to the side and pushing it to the side, it feels so good emotionally to work on a project that you know is going to pay dividends in three months. And it also assures you that you're going to be around in three months. And that's not something I say cavalierly. I understand that the health of ourselves is the most important thing, especially in this crisis. Mm -hmm. But to make that emotional investment to say, I am going to make it in three months, that's why it's worth taking this course. It feels good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, I mean, what what's sort of the basic financial situation that anyone should be in to be able to weather a storm like this? Um, you know, maybe maybe like how much cash reserves they should have in comparison to whatever their monthly expenses are, or you know, what's what's some basic things that people should positions that people should put themselves into financially to consider themselves to be relatively resistant to these types of occurrences. Yeah. So look, I'll, I'll be honest with you. When I hear that, there's kind of two components, but they are the same thing. So I don't have a good underwriting change that should be made, but I can use like a metaphorical version and you can do this and apply it to your own business. So when recessions tend to happen or anything stressful in life, let's just start with the finance and talk about the other stuff in a second. People tend to get pushed to their brink, right? They look at the sensitivity analysis. They say on a scale of one to 10, this is how bad things can be, 10 being the worst, one being a non a problem. And there's a recession and you get pushed up to the nine or the eight. So what you need to do is two things. You need to recalibrate where that scale is. You need to get yourself in a financial position so that another thing can happen and you can overcome that. Because how many times have you heard the story where there was the one-two punch that actually ruined someone's business? So for retail, for example, it's Amazon. This is presenting a clear risk. Okay, wow, we're a pizza company that also sells like some little product. Well, our product is now selling on Amazon 
not through us. And we're really struggling because of the little toys we sell or whatever, but at least we have the pizza business. Oh no, COVID happens. Our foot traffic is down. Now we're really in a problem. So what that same business needed to do was financially create reserves, but also create income streams that allow them to overcome that financially. Now, the same is true from an emotional standpoint. Um, on a scale of one to 10, people may be very close to that 10 right now. You have to recalibrate that scale so that the one-two punch doesn't knock you out. How many times have you heard a story where someone goes, well, I lost my girlfriend, then I lost my job, and I've never been the same since? It's the tale as old as time. It's the same with the economy. Well, the dot-com bubble happened, and then 9-11 happened, and my business was never the same since. So be very cautious about how you can recalibrate both financially and emotionally to prepare for what's coming next. The main concern in this one is coronavirus happened and then the year, you know, the debt, um, corporate debt bubble popped. That's something that people have been talking about for 10 years. So prepare yourself for the second punch. And by the way, if I'm wrong and there is no second punch, then it's just you're better prepared. So there's really no downside. And the emotional part is very cheap, but it takes time and it takes working out and it takes be meditating and it takes actually dedicating yourself to the self-care component i'm totally with you on that one mate and and i believe that it's our responsibility to be prudent and anticipate these sort of things and know that we can handle the worst case scenario i mean that's the way i look at real estate investments i look at like okay i'm looking at this real estate investment what's the worst thing that could happen here what's the most likely thing that's going to happen and what's the best thing that's going to happen and one of the first things i need to figure out is can i handle the worst thing that's going to happen if i can't then that's not an investment i'm going to get involved in and um, that's actually something that uh, my wife and i did when we first noticed that there was going to be a big impact with all of this stuff with COVID and the economy and and, and whatnot and we just looked at it and we're just like, all right, what if like the worst thing happened? What if like nobody pays rent? What if like, and we ran for all these scenarios and then we got mentally okay with, um, with the worst case scenario. And that's made things so much easier moving forward. Cause they're not like, oh man, I hope this doesn't happen. It's like, hope that doesn't happen. It's like, if that happens and a likelihood of like all of those things happening at once is very slim. Uh, but at least we're in a position that we feel, we believe that we can make it through. And that's that puts us in a really good place psychologically because now we're not scared of anything you know i think yes. the, the people who are probably freaking out are the ones that don't they don't know how bad this is going to be and they just hope something doesn't happen exactly right and anyone listening to this i will tell you this right now you're in the top five percent of people who are emotionally and financially prepared for something like this what did i mention during this conversation i said that every conversation i've had over the last five years has been longer than 10 minutes has included when is the next correction going to be and how significant it's going to be? That may be and is likely the case for you as well if you're listening to this at home. And I can promise you that's not the case for most people in the world. So what that means is that now is your time to shine. You have to be emotionally stable. You have to lead people through the fear. And look, if your buddy calls you because he lost his job, you need to be the one that takes him out for a beer um, because you should be emotionally prepared for this. Yeah, that's a good point, man, because it's not just about taking care of ourselves. You know, we're, we're, we're having these kinds of conversations so that you guys can take care of yourselves. But the better you can take care of yourself, the more you can go out there and take care of more people as well. And that's a really, really cool. It's a really cool position to be in. So, um, mate, you're a, you're a syndicator hunter. You're a capital raiser. Um, how has that affected you on your path to freedom? Oh, you mean this particular challenge that's come up recently or just generally my, like, how's my business affected my freedom? Yeah, no, just generally with mm -hmm. using capital raising as a major key tool of your business, how has that shaped the, what freedom shows up for like for you in your life? Yeah. So a lot of your listeners are probably familiar with the concept of self-directing, you know, your retirement account, for example. I feel very, very fortunate because my life is very self-directed. If I want to take six months to write a book, I can take six months to write a book. If I want to go through a bunch of securities licensing compliance stuff, I can do that. I can change my strategies and the projects that I'm working on when I want to. And like I said, I can go on vacations whenever I want. I just choose not to because I really love what I do. I just did an interview 
with a microbiologist. I just did an interview with a CDC expert. And then I'm about to do an interview with someone who is like a total heretic and like doesn't believe that calculus is real. And that's actually true. So if you're hearing this and you want to listen to someone talk about how calculus is a myth, this guy named Stephen Patterson, who's like, doesn't believe that infinite sets exist. Like it's a cool world that I get to like reach out to this guy and hear about why he thinks that space and time are finite. I mean, it's completely wild. Anyway, um, that is how it's happened. Uh, it's totally allowed me to do that. But more importantly, it's made me realize that others can do it too. You know, I went to school and just like everyone and my skill set did not transfer over to the typical institutional setting in the sense that the results that I've had after leaving academia have been much more pronounced than the results that I had in academia. And I'm sure that a lot of people listening to this, um, you're self-directed yourself. That's the reason that you're listening to this podcast. Like I said, you didn't get taught to go and find Bryce of all people in the world. You found him and that's why you're bought into him. It wasn't forced down your throat. You found Bryce and you said, I like this guy. Like I love his Australian accent. I like the fact that he travels a lot. And this is my person. I've directed myself to learn from Bryce. That itself is just so powerful. But similarly, if you are self-directed and you get a lot out of finding cool people like Bryce, it means that there was a point in school where you thought, man, this is boring. I don't want to learn about this. And it makes me feel frustrated that I can't direct my intention towards something interesting to me. But then the moment that you're able to direct your attention. It wasn't that you didn't like learning about sociology. It was about the fact that you weren't interested in the type of social, like it wasn't compelling to you because you didn't pick the class. You didn't pick the lecture, you didn't pick it. Now we've got YouTube where we can literally learn advanced things, everything from engineering to how to invest in real estate for free by just finding things we're interested in and going deep on them as opposed to going light. And that's my big beef with the educational world is it's, you want to go to eight classes a day, learn a little bit about dinosaurs, learn a little bit about English. And I don't really care much about both. I want to go all in on one particular topic and be an expert. That's how the market actually works. I don't want to hire an employee that's kind of good at a lot of things. I want to hire an employee that knows everything in the world about graphic design. And that's all we're going to have them do. So um, that's the way that the raising capital and the entrepreneurship world has revolutionized my life is just being able to focus on strengths and being able to focus on the things that I love doing all day, every day. Yeah, and that's, you know, you talked about like laser focusing in there. And I think that's something that's like really important for investors to, um, to be able to wrap their head around too. Like in the beginning, I was doing, I don't know, probably like seven different entrepreneurial things at once and I was spinning plates and I was having super mediocre success. But then I laser focused on mobile home parks and it was game over. It was like, I had all, at that time, once I said, okay, universe, I am doing nothing but mobile home parks right now. Guess what happened? A ton of multifamily deals came my way and a ton of all these different deals came my way. And I just said, no, like that's, I'm, I'm laser focused on this. And, um, and, I, and I think that's very, very important. Um, <clears throat> talking about like getting the right information. I mean, I think we need to be very educated. Uh, I think we have more education at our fingertips, but how do we sift through um, information and how do we know if information is coming from a source that hasn't been manipulated or what's your, give me your two cents on um, how we get information, where we could get it from and, and your two cents on all of that. Man, this is like a whole podcast and that's actually why I asked my friend Stephen Patterson to come on and talk about his concepts um, because I did a podcast. It's so funny. I've done so many podcasts. It's like these little things come up, but I did a podcast called why I'm a fan of the fake news era. And basically the thesis was we have been led to believe that we are living in the era that fake news is rampant. And the reality is nothing could be further from the truth. What we're actually living in is the best time in the history of mankind to get access to reliable information. And what we are also living in is the best time for a central narrative not to be able to be pushed. And so I'm a huge proponent of widening the Overton window so that interesting and novel ideas can be brought to the forefront without gatekeepers. This is the first thing that I said in the beginning of our conversation. I'm very grateful for the fact that, you know, the Joe Rogan experience exists. As an example, if previously 
all of the interviews with intellectuals were 60 second sound bites on mainstream news sources. Okay, here's this person that has this idea, and here's this person that has this idea. What do you say? 30 seconds later. Okay, got it. Now, what do you say? 30 seconds later. Okay, that's the two debates, and that's it. No, the Joe Rogan experience is awesome because it's three and a half hours. And you find if someone's BSing or not in that three and a half hours. And that's just one example of many. Obviously, he's got an incredibly powerful show. But how many people that have listened to that show have been exposed to interesting ideas in a very deep way that they would never have otherwise without the lack of gatekeepers allowing to do that show? Right now, Bryce, you and I are having this conversation. It's not like before I went on, you said, don't say anything about the following topics. And I don't have a team of people back there telling me not to say wild stuff. It's literally a $300 microphone and me. And so that creates an incredible opportunity. So I'll answer your question though. I would suggest doing what most people do, even though they don't admit it, finding a few people that consistently deliver information that lines up with reality and listen to them. And if those people make massive mistakes and claim things to be true that are end up being false, stop listening to them. And this is like wildly unpopular. If someone blows it in the biggest way, they should not be included in the future in your potential outcomes. So there's many examples of this. Of course, the largest amount of blowing it is political because that's any kind of impact that's political is going to be, you know, they're just the way that the institution is set up. They have the military, they have the, the, the printing press, they have all the tools that can make problems really, really huge. But the same is true from just being with your friends. If someone tells you that you can't do something and you do it, hey, guess what? Maybe they don't have a good perception of reality. So that's my answer. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And I think we need to go out there and, and, you know, take a bunch of different angles, you know, like I like to get information from someone who's optimistic and maybe someone who's pessimistic and someone from like this side and that side. And then just like, like, like you say, choose my favorite people in those arenas and then meld it all together and join the dots because with sound bites, you don't get the full story. It's like, there's a big pie like this and they're giving you like this tiny thin slice of pie. And a lot of people walk away after watching those sound bites going, Hey, I've got, I know exactly what's going on. I, I've heard it from that source and that source and that source. And they all said the same thing and, um, and have, have people gone out there and really researched it. So, totally. I don't think that there's an abundance of, uh, of, of resources that are lacking here. I mean, they're everywhere. So, right. um, talking about these awesome, awesome resources, you put together a best selling book, raising capital for real estate. You want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. Um, it's available for free. We gave away a thousand copies. We we're supposed to give away a thousand, thousand went away very, very quickly. So now we're giving away the first 5,000 and it's available at raising capital for real estate.com. Basically. I was inspired to, that's right. So this is the book here. That's exactly right. So um, in short, I'm a huge proponent of allowing people to control their own financial well-being. And my contribution to that end was writing a book that was basically an A to Z step-by-step -step blueprint for how you can build a business to raise capital. And most importantly, I failed miserably on my first capital raise and realized I never wanted to try to chase around investors again. I never wanted to try to convince someone to invest with me again. I wanted them to be chasing me down. And I can tell you honestly that that is how my business operates. People find me, I don't find them. Um, so the book is literally my whole playbook on how I've done that. And I was inspired by people that have written other books on different topics. Russell Brunson wrote a book called Dot Com Secrets about internet marketing and building a brand and creating products. And he just gave the whole playbook away. I mean, it's a $25,000 coaching program. He wrote it and then gave it away for free. And so I said, no one has done this in the, the raising capital business, at least not the way that I would do it. So I did it. And the results, by the way, have been awesome. People have gotten a ton out of it. Absolutely. And I've read the book myself. It's an amazing book as a capital raiser myself. Hunter really digs into super important uh, key points in here as well. And like he said, Hunter's given away massive value. So how do uh, listeners uh, get a copy of this book, mate? Yeah, so it's raisingcapitalforrealestate.com and you pay eight bucks and you get the book. You can also get the audio book on there and a bunch of other bonus features and a bunch of other cool stuff. So it's like a free book and they're basically just paying for shipping. That's right. right. Awesome, awesome. 
And uh, you also have a cash flow connections mentorship program, which is real estate entrepreneur program that goes into depth on how to set yourself up to successfully raise capital. You want to share a little bit more about that with us? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, basically, I my career started in the wake of 2008. And what that meant was I knew a lot of people that got burned um, paying $50,000 for coaching programs directed by people that didn't flip houses or do any real estate. And I did one of those. It's not uncommon. It's not yeah. uncommon. It's just sad. And so I did not want to be the course guy. I didn't want to have a paid program because I didn't want to be associated with that type of business. It's it's just not a good business to talk about something you don't know about and to not be able to add value. However, as I start to learn more and more and I definitely am an expert in this field. I started to realize there wasn't a resource out there that someone could go through a three month program and at the end know more about the business than even some of the experts. And so I felt it's like one of those things where when you hear about a challenge, I know you run a, run a marathon. So, like, you hear, you think about running a marathon, and you're like, that sounds like a nightmare. And you probably sat on it. You didn't immediately go, oh, good, I'll sign up for it. No, you probably sat under your desk for two days thinking, please, God, don't make me run this marathon. That's how it was for me in this program. I thought it's going to be a lot of work. I don't know if I want to be that guy. And then I just decided I owe it to the community to create this because there's nothing like it. Created it, and now it's turned into something I love uh, because of the results, because of the level of depth. If you read my book, which like eight bucks, if you see the level of depth and you like the way it's written because it's not for everyone, then that like the, the mentorship program is like the next step. And it's something I'm really proud of because it attracts the right people, in my opinion. Awesome. And I've heard a lot of people say very good things about this course too, cool. mate. Um, people from all walks of life, you know, seriously, seriously savvy investors that are like, hey, man, this is legit. Cool. So uh, hats off to you, mate. Um, how do people find out about this course? Yeah, so that's CF, C, C is in cash, F is in flow, C is in cash, mentorshipprogram.com. And then the investing company is asymcapital.com. So if you're an accredited investor and you're interested in investing in any of the asset classes that we talked about today, that's the link. Beautiful. And all of these links are going to be available at the bottom. If you're watching on YouTube or if you're listening in the show notes, it's going to be available on our website. So um, on Freedom Hack Radio here, we're always talking about you know, how to get the balance between financial and health and relationships and spirituality and having fun. Hunter, do you have any daily rituals that you that you have every day that you think like puts you in the right place that you need to be to have success overall in life? Yeah, I'd say that the number one is just working out. And I don't mean passively. I mean, redlining yourself on a regular basis. So what that means is you got to push the limits. And what happens when you do that is everything else seems to fall in place. So when you're sore, when you hit that red line in terms of cardio, when you do anything where you're like need to recover, all of a sudden everything works, right? So what happens is you need to sleep more. What happens is you don't want to eat crappy food because you know your body needs nutrition. It's not just about having a good time and eating things that taste good. So that alone will help in a huge way. I'm actually a huge proponent of strength training. So, you know, doing instead of sets of like eight to 12 in terms of weightlifting, um, I really like incorporating sets of three, four, and five because it taxes not just your muscles, but your central nervous system and your skeleton. And it, especially for guys, it makes you feel strong, like not inflated. Like the bodybuilding thing is like eight to 12, where you feel like kind of inflated, which can be cool, especially for photos. But in terms of like doing heavy squats and heavy deadlifts, you just feel like you're put on this planet to lift heavy stuff. And again, that's like the whole world of like training that central nervous system, putting a bar on your back that weighs more than you. Like there's something that says, I need to, this is a life or death type of situation that I'm mimicking in the gym and overcoming that adversity has just tremendous impacts in terms of life and business and dealing with like stress. That's just one, agree, but that's mate. like the most important one in my opinion. Yeah, I think, you know, having a solid workout is definitely one of the best things in the day, not just for my health, but for my mind, man. It's like I can I can have a super chaotic day and everything's going wrong and then I go smash a workout and I come out of it and I feel amazing. So uh, that's that's awesome. And what's the biggest piece of advice you have for our listeners today? 
if you're listening to this and you don't feel yet like you have hit a ceiling on what's available in the podcast world, don't make any investments yet. I really, really like investors to be super, super confident in terms of making their investment. So now you will do this. If you go all in on education, which you should, you will eventually start to feel, I know what all these terminologies mean. I know, I know what, I know who Bryce is as a person. I know like what his gut instincts are. And, and like anybody in the podcast world could tell you this, you can't BS your way as a podcast host, which is what the, why it's so cool. So, you know, there's all these programs out there. Once you start to feel like you're a hundred percent confident that you know who to make a bet on and how the investment is going to play out, only then should you move forward. There's no better time to go all in on education than right now. So um, just do it slowly. And by the way, real estate is always one of the best investment vehicles. There's people that have made money in real estate for decades and decades and decades. There's always going to be an opportunity. So the key is not to lose money once. So the way you do that is just focus on education. And once you invest, you can sleep like a baby because you know what you're doing. Yeah, I agree, you know, and there's there's investors out there that are reluctant to spend, you know, like a couple hundred bucks on a valuable course, they can save them like hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars, especially when you're getting into, you know, larger mobile home parks and self storage and uh, retail investments, we're talking like, you know, big paychecks there. And so if you if you get it right, good deal. If you don't get it right, um, you'll be very, very sad that you didn't go out there and get educated. And like you mentioned, you know, most of the education that you can get is free out there and there's tons of it. So you will hit a ceiling on that. Time. You will hit a ceiling on the free stuff. And then the question yes. is now look at things on a risk adjusted basis. Should I invest a hundred to potentially save or make myself a hundred grand? It's a no brainer. Yeah. And the specific thing that you want to learn more on. Right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so how can people keep the conversation going with you, Hunter? So they can reach out to me. I'd be happy to send you some free. If you listen to all this interview, by the way, thanks so much. We've been going for quite some time and I've got to touch on a bunch of stuff. Um, if Since you did make it through all the way to the end, shoot me an email, hunter at asymcapital.com. I'll shoot you a couple of free eBooks. I usually don't do that, but since you listen to like an hour interview, um, there you go. Hunter at asymcapital.com. I'll send you a bunch of free stuff. Good deal. Very generous. That's awesome. Is there anything else you wanted to leave us with before we take off? That's it, man. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate you coming in today, brother. Thank you very much. Happy to do it.